they erupt from our subconscious. Our nightmares and deepest fears take form on the silver screen, becoming monsters of all descriptions. From the supernatural undead to nature personified, come to avenge the desecration of the natural world. We are terrified by them. We are fascinated by them. And then we laugh at them. This is the life cycle of movie monsters on the unified fear theory. Throughout history, horror has expressed the darkest anxieties of humankind. What we fear says a lot about who we are. This is the unified fear theory. The gothic novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, was first published in 1886. The famous story of a doctor who uses science to separate his better nature from his darker side, thus releasing a murderous sociopath from his own subconscious, was written by Robert Louis Stevenson and became a tremendous hit. A year later, the first stage adaptation premiered, and in 1908, Jekyll and Hyde came to the screen in a silent film some consider the first American horror film. This version is, sadly, a lost film with no known existing copies. But in 1920, renowned actor of the day John Barrymore starred in a film version of Jekyll and Hyde which became a classic of the silent era. The transformation scene in which Dr. Jekyll becomes the evil Mr. Hyde thrilled and horrified audiences. It is a testament to the acting skill of Mr. Barrymore that the transformation was done in one single take, with no makeup effects at all. The change performed through expression and body language alone. The film was a big commercial and critical success, in spite of, or maybe because of, some reviewers of the film who actually expressed concern that seeing the dread face of Barrymore's Mr. Hyde could adversely affect the mental health of those who saw it and cause negative prenatal influences on expectant mothers. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was the most talked about film of 1920 as filmgoers flocked to the theaters to be frightened. In 1925, Stan Laurel, a year before teaming up with Oliver Hardy to form one of the most famous comedy teams in film history, Laurel and Hardy, made a comedy short that would be an early indicator of the life cycle of movie monsters. Dr. Pickle and Mr. Pride. The film is an obvious spoof of Jekyll and Hyde, with Mr. Hyde's heinous crimes of murder and abuse in the original tale reduced to stealing a child's ice cream and shooting spitballs. This is the earliest example of the movie monster's life cycle. The monster frightens us, the monster intrigues us, then we laugh at the monster. The biggest example of this cycle involves the classic Universal Monsters. In 1931, Dracula starring Bela Lugosi and Frankenstein starring Boris Karloff both premiered to big box office success. Dracula captivated audiences with its dark gothic trappings and its alluringly handsome and lethal vampire, played by Lugosi and Frankenstein chilled audiences with its bleak imagery of death and a creature born of fragmented corpses portrayed brilliantly by Karloff. Dracula and Frankenstein ushered in the era of universal monster and horror films. They were quickly followed by The Mummy, The Invisible Man, and a decade later, in 1941, The Wolfman. Each monster starred in a series of sequels and crossovers that all drew audiences to the theaters. 
then, in 1948, needing to bolster their flagging popularity and noting the continued popularity of the monsters, comedy team Abbott and Costello released possibly the best horror comedy of all time, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. They met Frankenstein, Dracula, and the Wolfman, to be precise. All three creatures provided the menace and chills, while Abbott and Costello provided the laughs with their over-the-top reactions to the supernatural circumstances. The film was a hit, and hailed to this day as the best of the Abbott and Costello comedies. It is well written and well directed, with great comic performances from the leads, but the film also tapped into a phenomenon that began with the Stan Laurel Jekyll and Hyde parody of 1925, laughing at the monsters that scare us to alleviate our fear. Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein was followed by Abbott and Costello Meet the Invisible Man, Abbott and Costello Meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and Abbott and Costello Meet the Mummy. In 1964, the Universal Monsters, Sans Abbott and Costello, moved in next door in the smash hit TV comedy, The Monsters. Frankenstein's monster became the muddled and lovable dad the Wolfman became his son, a wolf boy, and Dracula became cantankerous and lovable Grandpa. Though he never met Abbott and Costello, or starred in a TV sitcom, yet, the giant creature born of the atomic age, Godzilla, seemed to come to a similar fate. The original Japanese film, 1954's Gojira, was a serious and disturbing film in which the giant creature represented the destruction caused by the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, destroying buildings, causing massive amounts of death and injuries, and burning everything before him with atomic flames. Gojira, later anglicized to Godzilla, was a towering figure of blood-chilling horror. By 1963, the embodiment of atomic terror was battling a comically unconvincing King Kong, and in later films, he could be seen dancing, taking pratfalls, and giving his offspring a fatherly ride on his tail. Another monster gone from horrific to humorous. Arguably the most engaging, interesting, and frightening monster of the 1980s was a child murderer who was burned to death by vigilante parents and returned from the dead to take deadly revenge in the dreams of their children. Freddy Krueger from 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street. A true classic of horror cinema which spawned several sequels, a remake, and a short-lived TV series, the success of the film lies with its unique, charismatic monster. The disfigured, psychotic, wisecracking nightmare with a razor glove, Freddy Krueger, played by Robert Englund. By 1987, Freddy was lending his voice to a novelty album called Freddy's Greatest Hits, with such songs as Dance or Else, in the Midnight Hour, and the single from the album, Do the Freddy. None of this is to say that these monsters have lost any of their potency or ability to shock and frighten us. New monster movies are constantly being released, featuring variations on the classic monsters and newly invented ones. Laughter does not sound the death knell of a monster, and in fact, it can serve as an indicator of the monster's popularity. Laughing at or with the monsters says much more about us than it does about them. It seems the way we deal with monsters, with these creatures that resonate with humankind's most primal fears, is to, over time, soften their image, find humor in their horror, to take a bit of sting out of the fear.
but the next monster is always there, bubbling in the back of our minds, waiting for someone, somewhere, to unleash them on the movie screen. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and hit notifications so you won't miss our next exploration into the world of horror on the Unified Fear Theory.